What's happening nerd squad and welcome back. Marvel's Eternals trailer just dropped over the weekend and fans couldn't be more excited. This movie looks absolutely beautiful. It looks fresh. It's diverse. It's just what the MCU needed. All these elements that are long overdue for the MCU. Oscar award-winning director Chloe Zhao is behind the wheel of this cosmic adventure and until it's released November 5th, we have no problem re-watching this teaser and picking up little things that we may have missed. So here to explain some of those elements that you may have missed that first time around, I'm Taylor McWaters and here are the top 10 things you may have missed in that first trailer for The Eternals. Let's take a closer look. Number 10, the Bollywood sequence. Okay, right off the bat, one of the most dazzling parts of the trailer is that Bollywood dance sequence. Kamal Nanjiani got absolutely shredded for this film, and while he revealed some workout tips, he also hinted that way back he was training for this epic Bollywood sequence. Kamal plays a character named Kingo, and a lot of the movie is set to be in the present, where the Eternals are laying low, keeping a low profile so nobody knows who they really are, what they're capable of. And Kingo, well, he became a Bollywood star in doing so. so that's one way of doing things. The sequence is going to be one of the highlights of the film with around 50 dancers alongside Kumal. And when speaking to The Hollywood Reporter, Kumal said that when he walked onto the set and saw a huge group of brown people who were going to be in a Marvel movie, he felt such gratitude towards Chloe for creating this situation. The scene was full of joy, the actor went on to say. See, me personally growing up doing plays and musicals and all these dance teams, I'm more excited for this sequence than like any CGI fight that's coming. Cause we've seen all the CGI fights, we've seen all the gauntlets, all the punches, show us some more human stuff. I'll be dancing in the car on the way home, just like I did with Hamilton for five months straight. Number nine, the gates of Babylon. So the Eternals will take place throughout many years in history, whilst most of the film remains in the present. Now in the trailer alone, we see a glimpse at the gates of Babylon, and it's hinted that the Eternals could be linked to all seven wonders of the world, which is pretty exciting. In Eternals, the Herod Factor, this is where we see Athena and the Deviant Crow begin their romance. Now the Eternal Gilgamesh is also attached to the history of Babylon, and it seems like the Eternals have revealed their true selves at this point in the film. And before we continue on with this list, if you wanna go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, that would be awesome. We're so close to getting back in the studio, but for now, those likes really do support us while we're working from home, staying clean. You all are the best. Thank you so much for your constant support. Now let's get right back into this list. Number eight, Sprite. Now in the trailer, we also get a brief look at Sprite. Sprite is played by Leah McHugh in the film, and Sprite made their first comic book appearance in the Eternals issue 9. Now they're quite different than the stoic and noble other members. See, Sprite was actually considered a trickster who would taunt other members with these marvelous illusions. Icarus didn't take that too lightly. Sprite is a class 5 of 5 Eternal when it comes to his skills in illusion casting. They affect all five senses and are virtually indistinguishable from the real thing. J.M. Barry's Peter Pan was actually inspired by Sprite after witnessing them levitating in front of them in Hyde Park, London. What a sight to see that would have been. The look certainly does match. Sprite gets even more powerful from Chrono's experiments with the cosmic life force. And the only thing that Sprite can't really do is grow. Yeah, they're stuck with their 11 year old body. And during the wide rebirth of all the Eternals, Sprite was reborn as a girl. This occurs every 25,000 years, give or take. There's a shot in the trailer where Sprite is partying it up on a private jet with bodies laying in the background. Now the plane has a K on the door, which hints to viewers that this could be Kingo's plane played again by Kamal and Johnny. Some believe that Sprite is gonna be the main villain in the film, secretly. Who knows? Number seven, Gilgamesh. Played by Don Lee in the MCU, Gilgamesh is the strongest and kindest member of the Eternals. He was exiled along Thena, Angelina Jolie's character, and Gilgamesh made his first appearance in the Eternals issue 13. He was born before the Ice Age, and in 3000 BC, the Eternal became Gilgamesh, King of Uruk in Sumeria. Now in ancient times, he would wander the earth battling these monsters or these tyrants. He would fight alongside Hercules as well. It was quite the show. He fought for the Roman Empire as a centurion. He then joined the Avengers in issue 300. But also in Captain America Annual 11, around 3000 BC, the Cronins attempted to take over earth and beginning with their landing zone, Babylon which we see in the trailer. Now they had to go toe to toe with Gilgamesh and a time traveling Captain America, which is pretty fun. Now we did see a Captain America style shield in the trailer for a hot second. So maybe we'll get a nod to some sort of interaction with the pair. The line at the end of the trailer was icing on the cake either way. The line at the end of the trailer was the icing on the cake either way. They're all eating at the table. And then they mentioned how Cap and Iron Man are both gone. 
and who should lead the Avengers now? Who do you guys think? Let us know in the comments down below if there should even be a new leader for the team. Number six, Makari speed reading. Played by Lauren Ridloff in the film, Makari is going to be quite fun to watch on the big screen. Their body is augmented by cosmic energy and they have complete control over their molecular structure. In the comics, they started their run in Red Raven Comics Issue 1 as Mercury, then later on in Captain America Comics Issue 1 as Hurricane, and then finally in Eternals Issue 5 in the mid-70s as Makari. Makari is the child of Vern and Mara, born in Olympia, Greece. Their passion for speed was applied to their sciences, and Makari designed these high-velocity transport vessels. We see Makari zipping through the trailer a couple times, at the end of course when the team lines up in front of Babylon, but also when it comes to studying. So Makari speed reads, and they're also quite the teacher as well. Under the name Thoth, they taught the Egyptians how to write way back in the day. While Makari is speed reading in the ship, you can see some medieval armor nearby, suggesting that they collect items from every civilization to study which would make sense. Number five, the Unimind. Near the end of the trailer, we see a glimpse of the Eternals uniting. They create what's called the Unimind. Now the Unimind is a Celestial's greatest gift to the Eternals. The Unimind is made of light, mind, and pure energy. This is created when a group of Eternals come together and join their intelligence and will. Now the Prime Eternal is referred to the member who can summon the ritual. It's determined who the Prime Eternal is by either Herodom or by combat. Now there's a couple of ways this could go down in the movie. See, Jack Kirby actually spent a little time over at DC when he created the Fourth World Saga, which included Mr. Miracle, the Forever People, and New Gods. But once he returned to Marvel, he was inspired by these large-scale cosmic sci-fi elements and thus began to write and draw the Eternals, which made its first Marvel debut back in 1976. So Kirby's idea when it comes to the uni mind was that only the Prime Eternal could initiate it, whereas recent runs, any Eternal can bond together. Now the uni mind gets stronger, of course, the more Eternals that are added into the mix, and honestly, I'm here for either version. I don't really care how this goes down on screen. If only one can initiate the ritual, then the stakes will be high. If numerous Eternals can combine, we're in for more team-ups and Marvel circle shots. So. It's a win-win. Number four, Druig. Played by Barry Keegan, we saw our first look at Druig. They made their first appearance in Eternals issue 11, and Druig, referred to as the Lord of Flames and Nightmares, what a title that is. We don't see him too much in the trailer because in the movie, at this point, he actually disagrees with the extent in which the Eternals go to with their influence on humans. We see him almost like a cult leader in these short clips. Druig was the Polarian eternal son of Valken and cousin to Icarus. He was power hungry, and on top of that, he was raised a disappointment to his father, who didn't even give him the time of the day in the first place. A thousand years ago, when the Eternals were preparing for a third host of Celestials, Druid worked alongside Valken, Ajak, and his uncle Varako. Now his job was to help prepare the sites for the Celestials' arrival, but during this, Druid snuck off and tried to take power from an entombed deviant, Dromedon, but accidentally ended up unleashing him instead. Oops! So Thor had to come in and help the Eternals beat Dramadon, but Uncle Varako lost his life in doing so. Not good. Number three, Celestial Origins. Making their first appearance in Eternals issue one back in 1976 as well, the Celestials have been seen many times in the MCU. This actually isn't the first time we're seeing or hearing about them by any means. There were actually billions of Celestials once upon a time until a weapon known as the God Killer took most of them out. They are powerful extraterrestrial cosmic beings and they are the ones who created the Eternals and the Deviants. Now these space gods are around a thousand feet tall, give or take, and we see the inside of one of their heads in the MCU. The first celestial host arrived to Earth a million or so years ago when they created the Eternals and Deviants, but later on they were the reasoning behind the existence of mutants as well. So Marvel could be following this timeline and holding off on mutants until after this movie, which would make sense, seeing as they created the mutant gene and all. Now the second host on Earth sunk Atlantis, which we might actually see as well. We see a volcano erupting and some think that that is actually Atlantis' the demise in the trailer. The third one got into a fight with the Sky Gods because it wanted the right to toy with humans. So they aren't exactly the most calming of entities, some would say. Number two, the timeline. The history of the Eternals ended up explaining a lot of backstory for Marvel's finest, including the mutants like I mentioned earlier. But there's other alien races out there that the Celestials did experiments on in all parts of the universe, not just humans and not just Earth. They were also involved with Skrulls and the Kree. Now these experiments put on the Kree actually inspired them to do experiments of their own, which led to the creation of the Inhumans as well. Now the scrolls also being a creation from the Celestials makes you wonder whether or not we'll see this tie together in the MCU, or will the movie go more of a Jack Kirby route and keep it separate? After all, there is a Secret Invasion series coming to Disney+, Plus, so I have a feeling Marvel's just gonna tie it all together like they usually do. Although to be honest, I'd kinda rather just have the Eternals be the Eternals. 
Kind of like how Guardians were separate for a while before meeting the Avengers. It was a good time. It felt cosmic. It felt different enough. It wasn't connecting. It was fine. It was still good. At the end of the trailer, it's funny that Captain America is referred to as Captain Rogers because maybe they'll squeeze some World War II history in there as well. I wouldn't be too surprised. And finally, number one. Thanos. The Great Titan got his head taken off in Endgame, but he also turned to dust, so he's gone twice now. But is he really gone for the MCU for good? Mm, I doubt it. Much of Thanos and his origins are still yet to be expanded on. I mean, we got a flashback to Titan when it was up and running, but that's about it. With Thanos being an Eternal, fans are hoping that we see more of the Mad Titan. In Marvel Comics, it was retconned that both the Titans and the Uranians were actually Eternals the entire time. So Thanos is now technically an Eternal, which would make for a pretty interesting backstory to learn in any of these flashbacks. The MCU should be going this route because in Avengers Infinity War, the Red Skull refers to Thanos as Son of Alaris, who is an Eternal. That, and we've also seen a Celestial in Guardians of the Galaxy 1 in full armor, and then in Guardians 2 as Kurt Russell. So I feel like Marvel's been teasing this Thanos connection for a while now, and this time around, they'll be able to fully explain it with the Deviants involved. Guys, what do you think about that first look at Marvel's Eternals? Drop your thoughts and concerns down in the comments section below. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button on the way out, and we'll see you next time. Peace.